So uh, all participants will be muted while panelists present. Um, if you have any questions, please raise them in the Zoom Q&A window. And um, if you have any clarification questions, we can address um, one between each presentations. Otherwise, all other questions will be presented afterwards. And uh, please know that the, the event will be recorded. Uh, you will be able to find the, the recording and also the, uh, the wrap-up report under this link. Um, so let me present you our panelist. Um, first of all, we will have an introduction by Ville Ninisto. Um, so Ville is a member of the European Parliament um, with the Greens EFA group. And um, today the format is going to be a bit more different. We will have our speakers to present um, uh, their presentation according to questions that uh, we ask them. Uh, so Vilja will start uh, by answering the question, why is action to protect ecosystem is so important for climate neutrality by 2050? Then we'll have Kelsey Parliament from Fern. Um, Kelsey will look into the current trends in EU forest and European forest in general, and um, what are the current trends in the carbon sink and where should we be heading? Uh, then Joa, um, then Joa La Paolo Fidalgo Carvalho, um, who is a professor of silviculture and a ProSilva representative in Portugal. Um, he will look into the vision of the sector, so the industry sector. Uh, what does biodiversity friendly forestry look like? And finally, and finally, we will we'll have Niels Mayer Ollendorf, who is from the Ecological Institution. And um, Niels will look into the EU governance uh, for carbon dioxide removals in EU laws and what could be removal of these targets, uh, how it could look like. Um, so, Ville, um, I will let you do the first introduction, please. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, okay, now let's get started. Um, yes, uh, obviously when we are talking about the challenges we have uh, ahead of us uh, when it comes to the climate and uh, biodiversity, obviously both uh, our, our existential crises uh, to, to humanity but also to our ecosystems as a whole and in so far in the last 30-40 years climate discussion has been uh, coming more and more into the mainstream We have lost Ville. <laughs> Perhaps while we try and get him back online, uh, we can move to another presentation. Yes, Kelsey, would you be up to that? Oh, wait a second. I see Ville connecting back. This is what happened with technology, unfortunately. We, <laughs> it never happened face to face. Anyway, uh, Kelsey, would you start your introduction, please? Sure. Do you, uh, do you see him connecting back again? Not yet. Um, okay, I just wanna make sure that I um, don't step over him. Uh, but sure, I'll uh, go ahead and... Uh, of a presentation. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Not yet. 
Okay, hold on one moment. And now? Um, yes, Ville, I see you're back. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right, Kelsey. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had to change the device for some reason. The other one didn't work, so so we have to have two devices always ready no in these times. It happens. Yeah. Uh, so uh, going back to the presentation, obviously, uh, if we look at the the climate and biodiversity challenges up until recent recent years, uh, the broader political understanding have missed that we have to tackle these two challenges together. But now there is a rising understanding to also to understand the importance of biodiversity. I, and I think this is the moment when we have to make sure that these two policies, climate policies and biodiversity protection are aligned together. And I think this, uh, this kind of like understanding also comes from uh, the fact that we have realized that achieving carbon neutrality is not just about taking down emissions, but it's, it is also about uh, keeping up the six. So obviously the sinks discussion, carbon sinks, and uh, and the discussion about uh, how those can be maintained uh, gives uh, biodiversity a lot more focus also in the climate context. And uh, if we're looking at more broadly about the, the consequences of climate change, uh, it's uh, obvious that already today a lot of the damage is done by climate change in the extreme weather uh, phenomena have a close link to, to the changes in biodiversity and loss of biodiversity. For example, forest fires have increased a lot already in Europe and we see the huge forest fires at the moment in, in Western uh, United States. And, and these kind of forest fires have a link obviously to, to heating climate but also to uh, natural uh, weakening of the natural uh, biodiversity networks and, and uh, biodiversity's uh, capability to protect itself from, uh, from uh, uh, drastic changes. Also insects and, and other, other uh, 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 kind of like uh, uh, invasive species have come uh, more and more to, to Europe and, and this is also something that uh, has affected um, biodiversity in Europe and weakened it, uh, and it also has a link to climate change. A lot of the species in Europe are also moving uh, towards the north with a warming climate, but then if, if we think about the, the very sensitive nature in the Arctic region, that those species don't have anywhere to move, so we have a, a, a prospect of losing a lot of the biodiversity in the northern hemisphere, especially in the Arctic region due to climate change. Um, so we realize that there is a link between these two uh, phenomena and also when it comes to addressing climate change all the sustainable methods of getting carbon neutrality and, 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 and keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees or at least close to that uh, all of those uh, sustainable forms of addressing this have uh, a link to keeping up the biodiversity and addressing biodiversity loss. Obviously, we have the, the IG targets to 2020, where we have, a, as a global community, we have decided to protect uh, biodiversity and reverse the loss of biodiversity, but none of these targets have been met. The problem in biodiversity protection has been that these targets have been more kind of like aspirational globally, and they have not been legally binding. Uh, obviously, the climate targets as well. I mean, there's a debate about how legally binding they are, but there is a binding agreement in, in Paris uh, Accord and the Paris Treaty is something that all countries need to report and monitor and scrutinize what they are doing and it can be also, uh, more action can be demanded. And now we are, when we are looking at the next uh, biodiversity meeting in, in, in China next spring, uh, along with the Glasgow Climate Meeting, I think in the next spring these two meetings, UN meetings, should be used as a bridge to bring uh, biodiversity issues and climate issues uh, closer together. We need to have also a legally binding uh, agreement to protect the nature of the world uh, in, in line with the Paris Agreement and this is what we need to get uh, next spring in, in, in China in the, in the uh, uh, meeting for biodiversity convention. I think uh, uh, if we look at the kind of like uh, uh, different uh, areas of action that we need to address when it comes to 
to uh, climate action and going to carbon neutrality. I think there is already a rather good roadmap, obviously not uh, achieved yet, but a roadmap to get energy production uh, to carbon neutrality or, or zero emission sector by 2040. The more difficult areas have to do with agriculture and the food production chain and, and obviously log logistics and transports. And these are very closely linked also to biodiversity issues. So I think one of the key issues to, to protect biodiversity is also to change, uh, change the way how we as, as uh, mankind produce food. A lot of the loss of uh, important forest areas and, and deforestation is due to the, the increased need for agricultural land or, or for animal um, herding and a lot of this production at this space is, is unsustainable. So when it, we look at this uh, the, from the European Union side, it's obvious that we need to have better policies when it comes to recognizing agricultural sinks, uh, also from the soil and, and uh, the kind of produ products we, uh, we produce, that sinks has to have to be part of the cap policy as well in the next period, but also it, what rules we apply to imported products from elsewhere in the world that we address deforestation and, and stop the production of, of soya, for example, in regions with which have been illegally logged and, and, and uh, the deforestation uh, decreases biodiversity and obviously decreases sinks as well. So uh, this is very acute in Brazil where the Amazon fires is a big discussion. Uh, so, so with trade policy, with agricultural policy, with climate policy, and uh, obviously biodiversity policy, both at home and uh, globally, we can address these issues in a lot better way than previously when they have been looked just you know, sector by sector, that, uh, that we have not been able to protect biodiversity in other sectors than just make separate biodiversity protection uh, goals, which have not reflected in the change behavior in the sphere of economy or agricultural production, for example. So I think the, the scale of the challenge is huge. Uh, obviously, we have a risk of losing even uh, one million uh, species uh, uh, if we don't change the patterns of production globally. Uh, and, and this scale of uh, mass extinction obviously does affect humanity's possibilities to produce food, get uh, nutrition, uh, get uh, access to fresh water and, and, and clean water. So, so there are a lot of uh, links that are, are coming every, more and more uh, acute every day in, in our dependence on nature. Ob obviously also the risks of uh, pandemics increase if nature does not have its own space, enough space to, 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 for wildlife to, to maintain its, its, um, its uh, existence uh, without uh, having, having the risk of confrontation with, or, or conflict between uh, wild animals in uh, unhygienic uh, conditions like, like uh, the ones in, in Chinese uh, wet markets that can create risk for pandemics. So I think what we have to, in essence, is to realize that biodiversity protection is important in all sectors of policy and no carbon neutrality can be achieved by short-term fixes where we just think about carbon capture and storage or uh, in increasing forest cuts and actually decreasing sinks. We have to increase sinks uh, and we have to protect our for the forests better and all renewables that we use in the future have to be in line with this policy as well. And finally, just a word about the European Commission's proposal now to increase the emission reduction target to 2030 by at least 55%. Yeah, we have the land use sector uh, in, in the proposal, but it's not something that I, as a member of the parliament, as a green politician, am very, very happy of because basically what the commission does, they use the land use sector, LULUCF, sinks uh, as a way of uh, uh, putting down ambition on emission reduction. So basically it's included within the 55% target. So without the sinks, it would be 52.8. And the big question is how you count, uh, how you make uh, the counting done you know, in, in increases of the sinks. If we mix the two sectors of so emission reductions and increasing sinks together, there is a risk of double counting where the forest industry can, can uh, play the good guy by by increasing their forest products and replacing, for example, plastic products with, with wooden products 
somehow you count in the things that you achieve, but not the loss to things that you actually make. So I think it would, it would be vital to have a separate sync policy that is important to increase things as a whole and look at the uh, very multiple or, or very complicated sector of land use separately and then emission reductions have to uh, also separately go down uh, to, towards zero emissions. We will need action on both and not kind of like use things as a way of having less emission reductions because it might end up being a very confusing system where you can double count things and transparency is lacking. But all in all, it's good that LULUCF and land use sector is understood that we need more things and not less things. But this has to be biodiversity based and no more short term fixes. Thank you. Thank you, Vile. Um, I don't see any clarification questions, right? So, um, Kelsey, would you like to present your presentation next? Sure, I'll jump right into it. Um, okay, here we go. So thanks a lot. There are a lot of comments that Vile touched on um, that I hope to treat a little bit more in depth in talking about some of the recent trends that we've seen in European forests. There are quite a lot of studies that have come out um, in the recent months that have added to this debate about how do we have the uh, land use and forests contribute more uh, to climate change and also to, to look at the state of forest health uh, currently. So uh, quickly in my 10 minutes, I wanna outline uh, some of these recent studies, uh, touch on a little bit more about what we need in terms of uh, policy to be able to address that and uh, some of the things that we need to watch out for. Um, and I think we'll also touch uh, briefly on the uh, discussion that's arising around the uh, increased 2030 climate target and uh, what it means to uh, look at land use and carbon removals um, in the context of increasing climate ambition. So let's touch on um, a couple of recent studies that have really helped sort of uh, summarize a lot of the information uh, that's going on across European Union forests. It's great to have all of this information in one place, although the trends that are being presented are worth um, looking into. The first one comes from the recent uh, assessment that was published by the Commission uh, at the same time as the announcement of the increased 2030 target. It was the assessment of the national energy and climate plans. Over the next 10 years, all member states are showing what the progress of their sinks are, are going to be out to the end of the decade. And we're looking at a loss in the carbon sink of a third compared to 2005 levels, which is definitely something to pay attention to in a decade where uh, we need quite a lot of climate action and uh, biodiversity protection as the impacts of climate change get worse. Uh, second, zooming in a little bit on uh, management practices and the intensity of management practices, we have a study that was released by uh, the JRC that looked at the rise in clear-cut areas of almost 50% um, as of 2015, so this was compared to earlier on in the last decade. And finally, looking at some of the most biodiverse areas that we have, uh, we have a very a good report from Sabatini et al. that looks to map the primary forests that are uh, left in Europe. We have 180 million hectares of forests. Um, there are many new forests being planted, but in terms of those that have um, high ecological integrity, we're looking at less than 2% and not all of these forests are protected and a large amount of them are not protected from harvesting that could um, that could erase the biodiversity left in, in these small areas. So all of these different developments you could see is sort of different perspectives on an overarching problem. So the causes that have been brought up in many of these analyses have basically uh, been linked to a continuation of harvesting practices. This can be seen very clearly in the forest reference levels that were laid out under the land use, land use change and forestry or LULUCF regulation, um, where we're basically seeing into the first half of this decade, uh, a large hit to the forest sink particularly of around 18%. Um, there is also the recent expansion of wood 
market, which is just in the JRC study. And there we can obviously link that to European Union policies around the uptake of renewables, particularly biomass, of which a certain part of that is going to be wood products. And finally, um, and very importantly, we have the effects of climate change where we're seeing uh, much more intense fires, um, much more intensive bark beetle outbreaks. And this is leading to higher mortality, which as a result can also lead to salvage logging. So in a nutshell, basically what we're seeing is that the existing policy framework that we have in Europe is not leading to the headlines changing. Um, we still are uh, coming up against potential tipping points. Uh, we are seeing the impact that that's having on forests, um, whether they are monoculture forests or even more diverse forests. We're seeing very significant adaptation impacts uh, and a lack of resilience in general, uh, which definitely requires action to be able to turn the tide of where we are currently. So the question becomes what is needed, um, and some of these points were already touched on, but first and foremost, it's quite important that uh, the source of climate change, the main source of climate change is tackled, and that we are uh, very clearly aiming towards rapid uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. At the same time, we need to look at ways that we can enhance the natural carbon sink, but we need to be able to achieve these in a way that addresses both the biodiversity and the adaptation crises, um, which is particularly important. So what are some of the pitfalls that we need to be aware of when we're addressing this question of how to increase the role of forests um, in fighting climate change and into getting to zero emissions? So the first one comes back to this point on uh, the dangers of a net target. So the many think tanks and academics that have come forward um, explaining why there is a need to avoid combining emission reductions and removals from the land sector. So some of the reports that you see in front of you uh, were recently released from the new climate institute, uh, this is from Fison et al. and the World Resources Institute that are uh, essentially saying the amount of reductions that we should expect from fossil fuel, chemicals, other sectors should be unambiguous. It shouldn't be determined by the amount of progress that we make in the land use sector, um, which is particularly important. And this is why um, the debate that we're having around a net target is so contentious. So this is a, a, a figure, a range, essentially, that should be uh, quite shocking. This is the consequence of uh, real emissions reductions when you include land use uh, into a proposed target. So Europe has come forward with a 55% target, and there are discussions about potentially including land use into that target, which, depending on how much sequestration you eventually get out of the land use sector, could lead to only 50.5 to 52.8 percent real emissions reductions. Um, this is quite concerning, as we would hope to not put different levels of ambition against each other across different sectors, um, and also because the potential of uh, carbon sequestration should really be held to the potential of an individual sector and not to um, the needs of other sectors uh, because of delayed emissions reductions. So I'll get into that a little bit here. Um, something that is also important to remember is that at, at, a, at a policy level, we need to avoid setting the wrong incentives. So the two graphs that you see both reach zero emissions. Here they're in about 2060, but you can imagine they could also be in 2050. But the difference between the, the two different scenarios could really be put down to incentives. In the first scenario, we have the the responsibility of reductions that is majoritarily put on the most emitting sectors, um, which leads to a rapid emission reduction, and then the negative emissions that are needed stay within the potential um, and in submits uh, what the land use sector can achieve. In the second scenario below, you are uh, seeing something that is possible in a computer, but is not possible in real life in terms of sustainability of land use, possibility of technical deployment. Essentially, what is shown here is also climate neutrality, but where we have completely overblown our carbon budget, uh, the impacts of warming uh, will, will probably be felt uh, much you know, far into the future, regardless of how many emissions are taken out. And so it's important that we distinguish between these two scenarios and avoid negotiating delayed action through adding negative emissions into the target. 
Uh, and then finally, it's quite important that we are not focusing merely on carbon. There's a lot of discussion about how the land use, land use change and forestry regulation can be changed to alter practices on the ground, which we have noticed, which we have noted already is quite important. We want to see um, you know, qualitative changes in the way that forest looks and the change in practices that are happening on the ground. And in a recent analysis that we commissioned along with the UCO Institute, uh, one of the headline uh, messages that come out of it is that we will not be achieving changes in land use practices uh, just by fiddling with the accounting rules of LULUCF. There is a need for uh, additional targets. There is a need for targeting a change of management practice and working on changing incentives with foresters to be able to actually move towards um, a healthier forest, to move towards more carbon sequestration. And it points to the need to have uh, an overarching array of healthy forest goals. So beyond just increased carbon sequestration, we're also looking at biodiversity enhancement. And this is how uh, the restoration goals that are being discussed right now go hand in hand with uh, adjusting LULUCF to be able to uh, have a coherent forest policy going forward. So just as uh, what was said, it's quite important that we separate the emissions and the removals to safeguard ambition. This is one of the reasons why it's important to develop a natural carbon removals target separately. So it has to do with overall ambition. Within the sector itself, it's important to base that target on what the sector can do itself and not on the needs of other sectors so that we don't get into a scenario where we're massively overshooting uh, because we're uh, looking at how many negative emissions are needed because other sectors are not reducing. And finally, it's quite important to tightly bind any carbon removals target with uh, biodiversity goals, mainly what's coming out out of the restoration targets so that we have um, a coherent package that is addressing both carbon stock and forest quality uh, and biodiversity at the same time. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, now we will hear from Dao. Um, he will present the vision from the forestry sector. Okay, are you able to see it? Okay, great. So I'm glad to, to give my contribution and I also would like to thank Sven for the invitation on all the arrangements made. Um, I will present uh, uh, some subjects related to close to nature forestry in short, uh, considering time restrictions. Uh, the presentation covers general characteristics of close to nature forestry, its contribution to biodiversity, climate mitigation and adaptation, also some insights, economic insights with uh, study and practical cases, and benefits to sustainability. And finally, some recommendations regarding the EU frame for regulation and guidelines. At the end, I will address some few key actions. So uh, close to nature forestry intends to provide an enhanced following benefits and functions, uh, conservation of biodiversity, including ecosystem maintenance, protection of soil and climate, and also microclimate, uh, provision of um, timber and other goods, and also uh, amenity, location and cultural aspects, including landscape. Um, so, close to nature forestry promotes uh, forest management strategies in such a way that ecological and socioeconomic functions are sustainable and profitable. Uh, it includes market and no market uh, objectives and takes the whole uh, ecosystem into consideration, the components and functioning of the ecosystem. Regarding carbon, um, this is an interesting study showing the differences in carbon storage between close to nature and clear cut forestry. It compares the carbon stock in three compartments the biomass, soil, and uh, earth things or products, 
it shows as expected that the close to nature forestry provides a higher carbon storage. So concerning the climate change context action to 2050, harvesting, uh, removing all the stand has a negative impact. It reduces carbon stock for a long period of time, besides other negative uh, effects, uh, while the selective cutting is better. So considering the present climate crisis, that, uh, well, the error, the error will be to, to do things the same way. Uh, another uh, one important component for carbon and other functions as well is related with soil. As you can see here, a clear cut has a big impact on soil organic matter. The decline, the decline of soil organic matter extends for many years about around 15 years, uh, even after a stand has recovered. And uh, this strongly affects carbon storage as well as other stand and ecosystem, ecosystem functions. And uh, it only recovers to initial values after 40 to 50 years after the clear cut. So again, clear cut is very detrimental to the 2050 climate change uh, mitigation goal. Another interesting, um, another interesting uh, um, contribution close to nature forestry, among other, is that it promotes and gives preference to long-lived products. This means an important contribution for a longer carbon uh, storage. So, in relation to forest adaptation to climate change, the main guideline is to improve ecosystem ecosystem characteristics, which uh, result in a better response, ability, ability to chances, and therefore the adaptation capacity. In relation to forest adaptation to climate change, um, well, uh, the, the, um, one important um, aspect is the maintenance of the forest uh, microclimate. Uh, it has an important influence on tree and stand regeneration. Here you can see pictures of some forest, forest examples and on different region, uh, bio, bio geographical regions. Um, this is the case of um, uh, a stone pine uh, regeneration. Tree regeneration difficulties have been observed while with, uh, with the clear cut forestry and plantation while uh, studies and practices that have been implemented using stand cover and natural regeneration shows importance of canopy presence with a continuous and permanent stand cover. This has benefits not only for regeneration but also other aspects. Here is another study case where uh, I also been involved. This is it is has involved local communities with the different, different stakeholders, including young people and school as part of environment education, uh, also reported by, by FERN. Among, among other studies uh, and implementations, implementations, we compare forest regeneration success and costs in deforestated lands where forest was removed and harvested compared to natural regeneration in a forest where selective cuttings have been applied. Um, uh, in the forestated land, uh, the plantation and the restoration is very hard and costly. It needs machinery, soil preparation, growing stock, plantation work, etc. And success, success, success is very low. While in stands uh, managed with selective cuttings and close to nature forestry, tree regeneration is uh, obviously much better and with no costs, among other benefits. For example, uh, among other variables, soil moisture constant, con content between plantation and a forest is very different, different affecting um, tree survival. So. Canopy cover and uh, protection is very important, also in uh, and particularly in Mediterranean areas, where uh, climate and summer is very is very harsh, 
and the degradation of forest cover and the microclimate and soil leads to desertification uh, processes. Up to now, we have seen uh, uh, that close to nature forestry has many positive effects on carbon sequestration and storage, uh, as well on forest adaptation, but there are many other benefits. Regarding um, biodiversity, is, uh, well, this is a wide subject and there is no time to cover Many studies have been showing that <clears throat> diversity uh, of stand components has a positive effect on biodiversity, on biological diversity, and uh, biodiversity in general. For example, uh, for birds, which is a good um, biological group indicator, this study here shows that stands with uh, different strata, different tree ages and sizes uh, presents a higher diversity on birds compared to young stands after a clear cut or more homogeneous stands. Um, there are other uh, elements provided by close to nature forestry in promoting biodiversity as well. Okay, regarding economics <clears throat> and wood production, um, here studies shows that um, a close to nature forestry um, with the selective cuttings is much better both in yield and in revenues in profits. Uh, there is higher concentration um, of valuable timber with, with close to nature forestry, twice more, uh, in full volume and value. So in general uh, a close to nature forestry provides between 20 to 40 percent more wood production and 20 to 30 percent more in profit. Therefore, uh, not only is much more interesting in terms of carbon, climate change, but also provides better wood e economic revenues. Another interesting um, example is reported providing a survey and study performed in, in Switzerland. Uh, a forest development program was implemented after the 50s applying and extending close to nature forestry. To graph, the graph here shows the, the benefit re net revenue has been increasing regarding uh, wood production and economy. But not also, not also wood products. Uh, close to nature forestry is also valuable to non-wood non goods. Here, for example, it's a, a fr fruit production with stone pine. Uh, which um, shows higher non-wood production, higher, besides other uh, benefits. Uh, another example, another interesting example uh, regarding non-wood products is the use of acorn, for example, as a food product, uh, making bread, acorn coffee, and, and cookies, and so on. Um, we have established, for example, an uh, acorn association where uh, several products have been manufactured and introduced into market. This is very important because it adds value to native uh, oak forests, providing another source of income to owners. It's, health, uh, it's a healthy food and uh, with other interesting uh, aspects among, uh, among other non-wood products like uh, mushrooms and, and plants and herbs. Uh, well, this is another uh, study uh, and development case. Uh, so uh, being a native ecosystem, they are very important for biodiversity, ecosystem functions and carbon, besides many other features, makes it of high value and importance. Soil and water conservation improvement, clean water, wood products and high value timber, fire resistance, landscape recreation and so on. So there are these pictures uh, taken from different uh, development projects uh, that we implemented here. And uh, being an alternative to plantations, these are much more prone to fire and spreading fire faster because of oil and resin content and uh, very poor, very, very poor and limited in biodiversity, water, carbon, landscape 
and with high negative ecological impacts, uh, both ecological, economical, and social imp negative impacts. So, um, close to nature forestry uh, plays an important role in such uh, native uh, oak forests for many reasons, allowing important periodic revenues to owners, much higher compared to plantations. Also, is highly uh, contribution to sustainability, a better livelihood and environmental benefits. Uh, ecosystem services plays a great role on our livelihood conditions, life support and the planet itself. The forest ecosystem services are highly dependent on the forest characteristics and functioning. So they are strongly affected when a clear cut is done. Uh, and an important uh, aspect relates with an accounting system where positive and negative uh, impacts are considered and taken in the, into account as externalities in the economic model. So uh, we uh, have also created an association to deal with this issue. Uh, and uh, as a member, we, we have intended to implement such, such a system accounting system uh, at an international level. So cl close to nature forestry uh, provides uh, many benefits. Uh, this also means that uh, a forestry practice that has a, um, a forestry practice that has a detrimental uh, or harmful effects on soil erosion, loss of soil organic matter, clean water, loss of biodiversity or landscape degradation is not sustainable and acceptable today. So as a conclusion, uh, here are some few and short final notes regarding EU needs and challenges. So short term policies uh, are needed uh, and uh, climate change is coming, coming faster and this issue requires um, uh, EU law and uh, no country can, uh, can, go, can go alone. One important aspect is the importance uh, to develop regulation and law uh, to include in, um, and include close to nature forestry in forest develop development plans. This is very important, otherwise uh, it will be not implemented or take too long. Then um, include the co close to nature forestry in uh, national guidelines, also the payment for uh, forest ecosystem services. And final, finally, it's important to develop fin financial support instruments to help owners um, for forest transformation. For example, if a forest owner wants to have a better forest, uh, suppose he wants a plantation and he wants to implement close to nature forestry, there is a period of transformation, a lag period with less revenues uh, until the forest achieves a certain point uh, where it's ready. And for this transformation, it's very important to have. Um, um, financial instruments to support. So, thank you. Thank you, Joa. Um, this is now time for Niels to present this presentation about EU governments for carbon removals uh, in EU law. Niels? <clears throat> yeah, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, and you see my slides, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will be very brief. Um, I have only three or no, four slides to show. Um, and I would like to present you a few ideas how to design a removal target for the EU. A um, few things have already been mentioned and I would like to add and I would like to do this um, more from like a legal or governance point of view. Um, that's what, what we do at Ecologic to think through, I mean, how to design EU climate policies and laws in this case for removals. And we will have a paper on this subject and which should be out um, very shortly, maybe this week, maybe the week after. Um, 
And just to remind us, I mean, what we have, almost, we don't have it yet, but almost, we have um, a target for climate neutrality, um, which is if the climate law is adopted, which is a legally binding target, um, and that target, um, according to the Commission's proposal and also what we hear from Council, would be a target for the EU as a collective endeavor. It would not be a member state target. And as already has been mentioned, this is a combined target, a target that consists of reductions and removals. And the same is true, it has also already been mentioned for what is, has been proposed for 2030, a target including reductions and removals. And that is important um, for, for what I have to suggest. And of course, last but not least, we have um, a removal target in the LULUCF regulation, which is a no debit target. It's not um, a target to remove emissions, but it's to balance what is emitted from these sectors and what is removed. Um, what we don't have is this. Um, we don't have a separate target for removals. I mean, it's, there's no clarity what climate neutrality actually means. I mean, I just picked a very random and I mean, a, basically theoretical example, um, but in legal terms, it's possible. My, my example would be 100% reductions and no removals, or a more drastic example, 80% um, reductions and 20% removals. So that would be, would be possible in legal terms. I mean, it would be um, meeting um, what, the, what the EU is intended to adopt um, according to the climate neutrality target. Um, and it would be um, a collective target where member states contribute. It's different what we have seen in Parliament. Um, in Parliament, there has been also proposals for a climate neutrality target for member states itself. So it would not only be a collective target for the EU, but also for every single member state. In that case, climate neutrality for every specific member states by 2050. Um, and we don't have a sufficient removal target. I mean, the, for example, the no debit target, I guess, I guess there's agreement in this um, group is not sufficient and we don't have a legally binding restoration target. And I think it was, the point was made previously. Um, it's true. I mean, there are many factors why nature restoration um, are, targets are not being implemented. But I think one very important element is that this target is not legally binding. I mean, it's a political um, um, declaration. It's an aspiration, but it's nothing that really has legal consequences as such. So it, it could not be the case, for example, that we would see infringement procedures um, be used most forceful enforcement mechanism. Um, we all know infringement is um, sometimes lengthy, sometimes long, but I, it's, after all, it's still the most robust system and it's a system that member states take very seriously for the most part. So it's in a way um, the gold standard of enforcement and it's not applied to nature conservation in, in, in terms of restoration. And I think it's very positive that we now will see discussions on how to, um, how to set a legally binding target for that area. Um, so why is this a problem? And if I would have to visualize the problem, I would have three things. One is um, it, the current system um, as proposed or we almost have is, is comparing apple and oranges. It's simply um, making a logical mistake in a way. Um, problem number two, it's a black box. It um, hides many different things. And problem number three is it's too weak. And what do, what do I mean when I say comparing apple and oranges, black box and too weak? I mean this, um, a combined target I think obscures many things, um, many very fundamental things. And one is it seems to treat removals and reductions the same, but they're very different. They're fundamentally different. Um, I guess we all know this, there's no better sink than oil, gas and coal on the ground. Um, any other sink has um, its own problems. Um, but if we look at, you know, what is um, in a way, I mean, the gold standard, I mean, it's a bit ironic. Um, it is what um, nature has um, produced over hundreds of millions of years. And that is oil, gas and coal in the ground. Um, and the other fundamental problem, I mean, as we, I guess, all know, verification and compliance for removals is inherently more difficult than for reductions. Um, and I think, I mean, if we look at what we're discussing at LULUCF and on, I'm in different policy fields. It just goes to show how more complex that is than um, reductions or verification of reduction, which itself is already not an easy thing to do, um, but compared to removals is um, a piece of cake in a way. Um, problem number two is, um, 
if we have combined targets, I mean, where to invest and where, where to research. I mean, um, that system simply disguises where we should put the money in a way. I mean, on very general level, of course, but it's um, important that we have a clarity on where to invest and where to remove. I mean, in, in where to, I mean, where to put the investment removals um, and reductions and the combined system simply disguises that. Um, it makes it very difficult for investors to be very clear where to put the money. Um, Problem number three with the combined target is it's um, obscures responsibilities. Um, it's uh, hard to hold players to account, um, actually for the, partly for the reasons above. Um, I think it's very important to have clarity, I mean, what is actually required in terms of reductions and what is re required in terms of removals. Um, and the fourth problem is with the combined target, I mean, if you look at the system now, um, there's like sometimes the perception that we only have to start removing carbon sometime in 2050 and even beyond that. And that um, disguises the urgency of the matter that we have to implement um, and to do research and removals starting now, because as we, when we, as we know that it takes a lot of time to develop robust removals. I mean, we talked about nature restoration a lot. That is also a time consuming endeavor, but it's even, and it's, it's the same true for any other removal strategy um, that is also taking time. And we don't have the technologies and the strategies yet that um, are able to remove um, CO2 at the scale that is required. And I think it's also understand, I mean, the amounts of re removal we're looking at are ginormous and um, it, it's in, in, in important to take account of time. Um, and the last point, I think sometimes also forgotten in the discussions, there are very different ways how to remove carbon from from, from the atmosphere. Um, some are sustainable and proven, affordable and permanent um, to some extent, and some are, some are not so much. I mean, if I look at BEX, for example, um, that is in a field where we are very likely to um, repeat past mistakes of um, investing in um, biofuels, sometimes um, not, not sustainable. Um, if I compare that to a restoration of forest and the many co-benefits, I think it's also important that we don't compare apple and oranges again and removals are sometimes very very different in their implications um, the last point is I mean the other point is um, the, syst the system that we have now is weak um, I already mentioned that that the no debit target is not enough for um, going climate to towards climate neutrality and the other one is um, a non-binding target for restoration is in a way um, um, showing that we are not so serious about it. I mean, of course there is political momentum, commitment, et cetera. But if we were really serious, um, there would, shouldn't be almost, I mean, forgive me, um, a no brainer that this should be legally binding because that's the highest possible standard. And it's also the standard that allows us to be enforced at the most robust way and that is infringement. Um, so that is the problem. And this is the next slide would be, um, um, our solution, a proposal for a solution, which is a combined package, if you like, I mean, that tries to take account of um, reductions efforts, removal needs, and the question that removals are very different and with the clear priority for restoring nature and biodegraded ecosystems. And that is, um, in a way, I mean, if I had a graphic design um, of our proposal, how to solve, I mean, how for a solution, it would be an overall EU, EU climate target, a climate target um, for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, 2040 is, I mean, we all know this is um, also it's being discussed in Parliament and Council with different proposals. Um, that climate um, target would be have separate, um, it would to have two pillars. I come to this in a moment. It would be legally binding. Importantly, it would be quantified and it would be enforceable. Um, the big chunk, of course, is reductions. I mean, the major chunk of it. And that's why I made this um, box much larger than the other. It should be actually much even larger than this. But if I didn't, I didn't do this because otherwise, I mean, the CDR target wouldn't have, we couldn't read it. Um, <clears throat> so, and that target should have a percentage. I mean, that's, I mean, very well established, but it should also have um, a quantified um, reduction target in a way, an emission budget for the EU, just to show the overall amount of um, 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 eligible emissions for the EU over time. Um, that is also very important. Um, as you know, um, 
percentage points on target years itself are not sufficient to show that it is the overall amount of emissions that we, re that we emit over time that is relevant for the climate, much less so that we meet a target year. So that's why emission budget is also an important component of the whole structure. Um, and now I'm turning to the, to the second pillar, the separate pillar, which is um, the removal target, um, the CDR target, carbon dioxide removal target. Again, that should be a maximum in a way. Um, it should be quantified um, and it should be primarily through ecosystem restoration. It should be open to other CDR concepts provided they meet certain criteria, in particular sustainability, um, permanence, um, and in a way also innovation, because I think it's after all important that we invest more in research, that we understand other CDR concepts better, that we make them better, um, and that should be um, incentivized by, by um, a target that is split in removals, restoration first in a way, and other options second, provided they meet specific criteria. Um, and how this could be done, I'm happy to develop this in the discussion, but I think I, may, I already mentioned a few criteria. And this whole system should be underpinned by targets for member states. Um, so because a collective target tends to be a target of collective responsibility um, in a way, it's a bit strong what I'm saying, but I mean, maybe it points the right dire direction. So it should be a target for every specific member state that should be, um, should take off national circumstances. Um, so there could be, I guess, different what has been discussed in parliament, a target that would allow some member states to go climate neutrality earlier than others. Um, so that would be in a way um, sharing um, the efforts and the um, undertakings with, among member states. Um, and that national targets should in a way replicate what the EU target, um, um, target designs um, I just mentioned, yeah, I mean, so separate, legally binding, quantified, and enforceable. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, so we thank you for all your interesting presentations. Um, unfortunately, we only have 15 minutes left for uh, questions. Uh, apologies about that. Um, if you have any more questions, we will make sure uh, that some of our speakers uh, reply to you uh, by email or in a different uh, format. Our first question is from Toby Acrow from Wild Europe. Uh, I will read it out loud. Uh, it's addressed to Vide, but uh, if other panel panelists feel uh, they have a response, please do so afterwards. Uh, so first question from Toby, you said the energy production roadmap to carbon neutrality is clear, but forest bioenergy as a big proportion of renewables is not carbon neutral, uh, reduces sinks and several, severely damages biodiversity. What is your proposed solution here? Fide. Yes, this is a very good question and I think the other, other uh, presenters have said about the, the uh, negative effects of having a combined uh, target for emission reductions and, and Lulu CF. I think that shows that the risks increase the more flexibility you have this between different sectors that you can uh, uh, instead of do uh, drastic emission reductions you can uh, try to replace them with short-term sinks and the kind of like sinks and, and uh, removals work in a different time period with different mechanisms than emission reductions I, I wouldn't, you know, combine that these are equal to each other because that will essentially lower ambition if these are combined in one target. So that is the main reason why not to do it. But obviously, in order to protect biodiversity and protect sinks, emission reductions cannot have a negative hampering effect on the carbon sinks. And that's uh, precisely the problem with biomass. I think uh, there is an obvious uh, way of solving this. We need to have separate targets for uh, sinks and removals. We need to have uh, biodiversity protection targets also that are legally binding, like the 30% target for land-based and, and, and uh, marine uh, protection that, was, uh, that has been put forward. Uh, would mean uh, by a group of economists say that the benefits of protecting biodiversity in that scale are uh, five to one relative to the costs. So obviously protecting biodiversity also is economically viable in the long term. So we have to put those uh, uh, 
uh, as legally binding part of any Lulu CF target. So, so it's not just climate, but also biodiversity targets in the same package that you can't uh, produce with clear cutting in a way where you actually reduce the carbon storage. And my other comment is also that often the, the forestry side speaks about you know increasing sinks by you know we have we got so much wood that we can and then we have huge sinks when young forests grow but then you don't don't count in the previous loss of carbon storage so any system of removals has to include about also the maintaining of storage and obviously restoration is key here but on the energy side i think there is one key solution to solve this problem and that is that the whole effects on sinks and emissions in the production chain, in, the, in acquiring a raw material has to be count in, in the emissions of, of that source of energy. So basically that would uh, uh, stop biomass uh, uh, support, which is now kind of like the, the negative effect of things is not counted in. So it has to be counted in as a source of energy and then we have separate solutions. Thank you. Um, next question, next question is for Kelsey. Uh, so during your presentation, you show uh, the two scenarios. Uh, while the P1 scenario is probably what we all wish for, um, so Martin uh, Junginger is asking, how realistic is this rapid phase out of fossil fuels all over the world? Don't we need a mix of both P1 and P4? Kelsey? So, um you know, I think that the slides that I was showing represent a principle of making sure that there's a focus on emission reductions first. And uh, in terms of, you know, finding a certain amount of negative emissions that is acceptable, I think that's going to be constrained by uh, sustainability constraints. So, you know, what is possible in terms of available land that can be used to restore forests uh, versus uh, plant trees in a proper way versus produce food. And so I, I definitely think that even leaning too much in between P1 and P4 is, uh, is a dangerous middle ground. And I, you know, even though when we monitor, we're going to be looking at removals and reductions at the same time, in terms of target setting, we need to see what is actually feasible and sustainable in the removals category, and then, you know, require of other sectors that they need to uh, reduce rapidly to be able to reach carbon neutrality together with uh, the incentives that are put on removals. So um, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Alice Butcher. Um, so, Rile, you mentioned a potential risk for double counting, looking at substitutions of energy intensive products while with products. But wouldn't the full inclusion of LULUCF into the climate target ensure that negative impacts on the sink by increased biomass use for substitution would be accounted for? Uh, so, Hannes is from the OCO Institute. Um, I think I already actually partly answered that in my previous answer, but I think that, that the main problem with combining these two targets is that they are not measurable, they are not uh, accountable in the similar fashion. Emission reductions, even though it's complicated, is relatively feasible to, to do in a, in a separate system that where we actually can get a pricing for carbon. But the pricing for increasing the removals or increasing sinks is, is, uh, works on a different logic. Uh, so we have to have the negative effects, impacts on sinks within energy production or in the logistical system. Uh, within, it, that, that cost has to be also visible in the price of that product in the, in the, in the emission reduction. Uh, uh, scheme and then there needs to be a separating policy so instead of double counting which is the big risk of combining these two targets i understand that there are benefits that there is some uh, some bindingness then in the sink targets as well obviously uh, but but the risk is that there is more possibilities for double counting and, and flexibilities that, that will increase uh, decrease ambition instead we should have separate accounting uh, regimes that are so strict that we make sure that we at least count twice or it doesn't harm to count more or less twice 
uh, uh, the negative effect of, of, of some products in order to make sure that it, uh, price is included also in the, in the use of energy, but then also in the restoration targets. That, that would not be uh, wrong if you look at the, the total effects of the system of having it the price included in both regimes instead of having the risk of it being included in none. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, it was addressed to Neil, Neil, I think, uh, from M MG, MJ Sons. Um, so what about the vulnerability of the ecosystems um, that could result in unexpected reveals? Um, Nils, would you like to take the floor? I'm not sure I understand the question, actually. Um, so there are extra comments for the sector in some countries in European adaptation. Um, uh, there might be more permanent priorities that mitigation gives its vulnerability. And so what about the ecosystem's vulnerability? Uh, could it result in unexpected reveals? reversals of co2 storage yeah okay um no i think i mean i i think i got the question i mean um the the, the answer is i mean i think i mean when you look i mean listen to Zhao's um presentation and and what i mean and also kelsey has said the um level of carbon storage in um close to nature forest. I mean, that was the term that um, Zhao used and I mean, in similar terms are being used in the debate is simply much, much higher. So, and, and I think the other point is, and that is um, why reductions first is such an important criteria that, I mean, any sink or any removal is not as um, reliable as what reductions offer. And that is, I think the point I was trying to make that um, it's important that we don't compare apple and oranges in this context. Um, the dilemma is um, that all, I think pretty much all scenarios that take us to 1.5 degrees, two degrees, I mean two degrees or even 1.5 degrees, rely to some extent, to different extents on removals. So that is, that is the grim reality and we have to face it. I mean, and that's why I think um, the proposal to have a separate target, I mean, to identify clear account um, responsibilities, accountability makes so much sense um, because that allows us to clearly put into law that reductions come first. Um, so that is, that is um, I think, pivotal. Um, and anything that needs to be done on top of it needs to be removals, but it's only a small amount compared to that because of the issues you just raised. Yeah. Thank you, Niels. Um, we have five minutes left. Um, I would like to hear from uh, Joa. Um, maybe Joa would like to comment on uh, the vulnerability of ecosystems and um, the need you know, to encourage uh, more resilience um, of the forest. Joa. Uh, well, um, uh, regarding uh, climate change, um, so we have uh, two two uh, contribute to aspects. One is related with uh, mitigation, and another is uh, adaptation to to the new conditions. Uh, so. Uh, um, uh, the forest adaptation to I will uh, start with this last one. The forest adaptation to climate change um, is improved when um, we, we rely on uh, the functioning of, of the ecosystem, uh, as is the case when you use uh, nat natural regeneration, because there is a natural um, adaptation using all the genetic diversity that is presented on the ecosystem. And when, when we uh, apply practices that um, improves that genetic diversity, we, we are creating uh, a system that is more um, strong and uh, with a bigger resilience to, to the changes. About mitigation, so this is this deals with many aspects, 
and uh, um, uh, we have to to regard to to the different components of the of the forest ecosystem, uh, not only above the above uh, ground but also on the soil, which uh, accounts uh, roughly for 50% of the carbon. So, um, keeping uh, um, the functioning of the forest uh, is important to, to maintain to these two components, okay? Um, and also, um, the use of long-leaf products uh, helps to uh, sink the carbon for a longer Period. So, if you have, if we have uh, targets for 2050, uh, it's only 30 years from now. Um, so, use of wood on um, long leaf products uh, will, will help uh, um, have a great contribution to this. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, there is a, a certain inertia of the system, of the social system, uh, and uh, I would like to, to underline the, the, the importance to help uh, transformation of, of the forestry uh, that is applied in, in several areas, helping this uh, transformation process to a more um, nature-based nature forestry, and also um, develop an accounting system uh, where uh, positive and negative um, uh, externalities are considered into the, into the model. So uh, this is, this is um, also related with one aspect that Niels talked about, that is the responsibility. So that's very important to take this in, into account. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, time is up, unfortunately. Uh, there were many other questions in the chat and the Q&A uh, box. Um, we will ensure to answer to those um, in a separate format, either by uh, a wrap-up email or a report. Uh, thank you, all panelists. Um, this was a great session. Um, and goodbye, and see you soon. Okay. Nice thank to you. be with you. Nice to be with you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing this. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day.